My brother Steve was uh, five years older. He loved cars, a bit of a gearhead. Well, Julian was an executive director involved in fundraising. She was a terrific organizer, very well respected. Katie was a very good student. She worked hard at everything she did. And the first year she played water polo, she made it to the Junior Olympics. Nick Solly's been a big personality, full of life, full of energy. My dad's the type of guy who always wanted to have fun with his kids and family. We would be water skiing every summer and skiing every winter. He had been a veterinarian for about 30 years prior to the accident. He was barefoot water skiing and he fell pretty hard. Turned around right then, they called 911. It was on the trip in the ambulance that my dad fell into a coma. My brother Steve had an aneurysm in Vietnam. He sustained significant brain damage as a result. Katie was 16 when she got hurt. She was playing in a water polo tournament and she got hit really hard in the temple. I received a call probably at 7, 7.30 in the morning telling me that uh, they weren't sure, but they thought that they had my daughter. The car was so badly damaged that uh, I think they had trouble IDing what it was. One of the police officers asked, does Nick Navarez live here? I said, he's my son. He said he was in an accident and he's in the hospital. He's in surgery and you need to get there right away. She was not recognizable, uh, totally not recognizable. And she'd lost 80% of her scalp from the front to the back. My dad couldn't move. He was in a fetal position. There was nothing about dad's condition at the time when I first saw him that would lend me to believe that everything was going to be okay. In fact, it looked like nothing was going to be okay. The doctors said he's missing half his skull. If he lives, he's going to have about a 5% chance that he'll be little more than a vegetable. So, you know, we, didn't, we weren't given any hope. She actually looked fine, but she was running into door jams and she was sleeping 20 hours a day. I knew that there was something wrong. He was really not able to do anything. The only way you knew he was alive was the machine was moving his chest up and down for breathing. You know, this is the worst case scenario and it's, it's happened to us. You're traumatized. I mean, you've had a healthy, you know, strong, independent person that's very caring. And now you see this person in this vegetative state. You learn very quickly that you're not going back to the life you had before. At that point in time, uh, the treatment options were very limited. The conventional wisdom was that Steve would never get the signals from his brain to the muscles of his body. But I'm not the person to tell no. If you tell me it can't be done, I kind of disbelieve you. And in August of 1980, we opened the Center for Neuroskills. I was 23 years old. We had a staff of 10. We had three patients, and uh, one of those was my brother. We had him, and we said, how can we make him better? How can we make him more independent? How can we help him achieve his goals? And we built the program around him. We have now grown to 700 employees. We're in four different locations, but it's still based around what the patient's needs are. When we came to CNS, I saw patients who were struggling with smiles on their faces. And I saw, I heard laughter in the rooms and I heard positive reinforcement. And I, I felt like this was an answer to something that I had been hoping for for months. I expected to pack him up at some point and you know, take him to school, take him to college. I packed him up and I, I took him to, to brain injury rehab therapy and I, it was hard. You know, it was foreign to me. A bunch of other people with brain injuries, you know, I, honestly, I was, I was really scared, you know. I saw the people and they were in wheelchairs and I was like, I don't, I shouldn't be here. Julie had balance problems, coordination problems, optical problems, speech problems. And they started to, you know, approach and attack each of these problems uh, one at a time. The brain responds to stimulation any time it's stimulated. So if my brother was awake, we were doing therapy with him. 
know, from the time that he woke up and arrived at the center until the end of the day. It was a, a full day process and it was intensive. It was my dad's oldest boy. And he would say to me, leave the poor son of a bitch alone. Just tore him up to see a son like this. And for me to be figuratively tugging on him uh, just made him ache all the more. Nick said, oh, I hate it, I hate it. I don't, I don't need this anymore. I was really resistant, you know, I was angry that I was there, so, you know, I didn't make it easy on her. It actually hurts. Rebel all you want, but we're gonna do this. Pull yourself to the right. There you go. Do it again. They fought for Katie from the moment they met her. When I first came, I was at a sixth grade reading level with an attention span of one minute. Katie was on her way to college, and that was her goal, and Rose saw that. There's never a case that's ever the same. Some people may have more physical needs, some people have more cognitive needs, some people may have more counseling needs. No brain injury is alike, so that makes every program unique. When you go in there, they, they give you an assessment. You know, so me, my brain injury was so severe that I needed all the therapies. My dad literally had to learn how to walk again. I couldn't talk to people because you couldn't, I tried to say words and you couldn't understand me. I tried to print, but I couldn't even print. He was not allowed out of bed without a helmet. They started right in and working on me. You know, you're exercising your brain and she got terrible headaches and Rose did not let her give up and didn't let her walk out that door. She told Katie, you were a straight A student before you got hurt and we're gonna get you to that point again. That kind of relates back to this lesson, right? About asking for help. I was really angry and cussing a lot at everybody. In behavioral therapy, they would have these pretty cool little question games type thing, try and reason my, my thoughts and my emotions out with me. She just was enveloped by this place. I mean, it was, it was amazing. After a couple weeks, it finally hit me. We were all in the same boat. She said, Mom, I know why I'm here. We're all doing the same thing, we're fighting. We're fighting to get better and we're fighting for our families and we're fighting for our health. After my mentality changed to that, it made it fun and I was able to make friends. Time and work make all the difference. I came a long way in three months. Jillian, would you share what you did on your leave? Okay. I put the words that I was grateful for. I put my shoes on there because I'm mobile now. Oh, I wasn't yeah. three months ago. and. A picture of spaghetti because I get to eat again <laughs> and lots of food, which I'm very happy about. They let us know what was going on and, and how he was progressing at every step of the way. We didn't have to ask, we didn't have to pull teeth, you know, to get the information that we needed. To graduate from a wheelchair and a walker, then to a cane was feeling good. Eventually I got where I could walk without the cane to get to the point where he's now cruising around in a car, it's a big change. When my dad went back to work, I was astounded. Not only that he went back to work, but was working full time doing surgeries. It's just an overwhelming feeling. Well, at the end, I was able to actually graduate high school on time. It was really cool, it was really cool. It was hard for us having him so far away, but if he had stayed at home, I don't know how well he would have recovered. I'm a full-time college student. I work, I drive. The fact that I'm, I can actually cognitively hold this conversation with you is pretty much a miracle, and that I'm not paralyzed is a miracle. People like Jillian that are brought back, you know, eventually, hopefully, will go back to work and, you know, be active and productive again. You can't give up on the person to begin with. Ultimately, Steve got control of all of the muscles in his body, uh, all extremities. He got his voice back, he got speech, and that began when he was about eight or nine years post-injury. It wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, the textbook said, this doesn't happen. They got her, you know, even further than we ever imagined. Now I am in nursing school. I have straight A's to be a part of a nursing program. Working with patients who have had strokes and things like that, it's kind of come full circle. She is my hero. I've seen her fight like I've never seen anybody fight for anything in their life. Rehab takes time. 
days, months, years. And I think hope is such an important thing to have. My dad didn't give a lot of praise. You know, men in that generation didn't. But afterward, when he saw what Steve had been able to accomplish, he took a, a little two by six piece of wood and he put a quote out of a Reader's Digest. And it was, never tell a young man something cannot be done. God may have put that person here to do it. This is hard stuff. You know, you're dealing with people who have had um, a life-changing event, and it's never going to be the same. And I know that, um, but my job is to help get them past that point, and that comes from Mark. <laughs> we see the lives change around, the life put back on track, the lives put together. You just, uh, you, you, you become a family. Your patient is your family.